Thanks so much for coming down. We're here in Clinton McKenzie's um, perfect, perfectly situated pain cave. Um, and it's your relationship with Clinton that brought you into boxing, isn't it, really? It is. Um, I met Clinton about 15 years ago, and at the time he had a, a gym down the road in Norwood, which was really kind of grotty, old school, very smelly boxing gym, and I loved it there. And um, I've always wanted to do boxing, but boxing is not a sport that you do in France. And so um, uh, when I met Clinton, I mean, uh, I, I went to his gym, I wanted to do boxing, and I said, um, hi, how are you? He looked at me, he was sitting at his desk like that, and um, I said, I just want to learn how to box. And uh, we discussed it subsequently, you know, later after, after that. And he said to, to himself, you know, hey, here we are, is another nutter who wants to learn how to box. <laughs> and um, I really just fell in love with it and became instantly obsessed, completely obsessed with boxing. Now, you know, I'm not a boxer. Um, you know, I don't want to pretend that I am. I just love the sports and I've just immersed myself in boxing, training every single day, at times training three hours a day. And I remember Clinton looking, looking at me when I was uh, in his gym there, shaking his head, thinking, this guy is nuts, completely nuts. And um, I had no skills, I had no experience, but very quickly, um, just, you know, banging the bag wasn't enough for me. So I said, can we spar? I said, okay, I'll, I'll take you in the ring and we can spar. And we've been sparring partner for the last 10, 12 years, um, sparring up to 10 rounds in one go and uh, really beating each other up in the ring. But Clinton was much older than me. I mean, he still is, he's 65, I'm 49 now. But when we started, I was about 34, 35, Clinton was, was 50. But when you are sparring uh, with a, an ex-pro like Clinton, you know, who's an athlete, and Clinton knows boxing, you know, he is boxing, he understands things, he sees things that I can't see. When you're in the ring, he knows his way around the ring. I have no idea where I am, what I'm doing, but um, he's taking it slowly, and yet he's teaching me boxing the hard way. And we were just talking right now, you know, about the first time he knocked me down, and he was, knocked me down, it was a knockout, really. Uh, it was a really nice punch on the ribs, and uh, I fell to the ground, I couldn't breathe, he broke my ribs, it took me three months for me to recover. He was rubbing my ribs, he said, Freddy, Freddy, what's going on? <laughs> I couldn't breathe, and I was going, yeah, it's good, man, it's good, it's good, because, yeah, it was a good shot. Um, and um, called me at night, said, Freddie, are you all right? I said, no, I'm okay. And then I was back back in the gym three months later, training with him. And I, you know, I, I can't tell you how obsessed I became with boxing, you know, watching all the videos online that I could watch, you know, all the old fights, um, uh, reading articles, um, learning about the fine art of boxing because there is a lot of similarity, I think, with living and with the job that I do as well in customer service about boxing, because it's about the truth. It's about courage. It's about how you're gonna conduct yourself. It's about whether you are doing enough work or not enough work, whether you've got the skills or not. But if you don't have the skills, do you have that belief? Do you have that positivity? Are you able to defeat an opponent who's gonna be better, who's gonna be stronger than you? Are you gonna be there, you know, on the ground begging for your life on your both knees, you know, or are you gonna go out on your shield? And that's the question that I have to answer myself every time, you know, when we're sparring with Clinton because he pushed me to the limit, to the point where my heart is beating so hard that he cannot pump enough blood, pump enough oxygen. My lungs are just saturated, you know, I'm just, I can't breathe anymore. And in a funny way, this is the place where I want it to be. This is when I train, when I spar. This is where I want to be. I want to be in that situation because this is where I know whether I've got it. You know, it takes me to the edge of the cliff and only myself can bring myself back. And um, we've had some really, really rough spar with Clinton. And I used to drive on, we used to spar on Saturday morning. And I used to drive and uh, blast ACDC, you know, in the car, you know, maximum volume. It's a long, it's a highway to hell. <laughs> and in the same time, I had that fear, real fear, because I was going to spa and I was going in a doghouse. And as much as I never had the intention to hurt Clinton or to finish the job and to knock him out, never had it because he's a friend and we are sparring. So it's, it's, it's an interesting kind of very different sort of relationship, but we are friends first and foremost. And Clinton never wanted to knock me out. It's not the end of the end of the game. You know, we are we're friends and he's teaching me how to box, but he wants to win and I want to win. 
And inevitably, if you're in a ring, you're gonna throw some shots which are gonna be powerful, even though you don't realize they are. And somebody hits you and you think, oh, okay, you wanna hit me, I'm gonna hit you back. And then it's just exchange. No, it's like one exchange after another where you keep hitting each other harder all the time. So I knew when I was driving, I was gonna get into a fight. It was a proper fight. That's what you, that must be the day he said where you came in and you just were gonna stick it on him that day. So that must have been that day that he remembers so clearly. I, there was a couple of occasions where it was like that. And I remember in one, on one occasion, Clinton looking at me thinking, whoa, this is different. And even I scared myself that day because I was in a different frame of mind. I did not care whether I was getting hit, whether I was going to hit. I just wanted to win and I was just going to give everything. We haven't had many of those. We've had one or two of those. And I remember that particular day, in fact. Um, but now, you know, Clinton's 65, I'm 49. And when we were sparring, I, uh, look, I enjoyed the boxing, but I was not boxing to win. I was boxing to box because I loved the boxing. I loved that feeling of putting my gloves on, getting into the ring and having the spa. And I was thinking about the spa from the moment I left the gym after the spa to the next spa, thinking about what did I do right? What did I do wrong? Why is it that on the fifth round I gassed? How can I not gas in the fifth round? How can I carry on? You know, I was, it was all analytical. It's about analyzing my performance so that I can become better, knowing that I don't have the skills, I don't have the experience, I don't have, I don't have what he's got inside him. And this is why I really feel so privileged and, and forever grateful for Clinton for what he's taught me because I was able and I'm able to be close to a professional athlete who has a different mentality than I have because he's an athlete and they've got an engine, they've got a heart, they've got lungs, they've got some things inside that I don't have, but it's the mentality and it's that level of proficiency, that level of knowledge and experience that they have in a, in a sport, in their field where there is so much to learn, so much to say and a lot of the, the teaching and a lot of the things that Clinton taught me and, and that I've learned you know, about being forced to, to learn because I was against the rope and I had to find a way, you know, it's, it's things that I apply in my daily life. I still apply in my daily life. And, you know, one thing, for example, I wasn't so good at one point at doing presentations, you know, at work in front of loads of people. And being with Clinton in the boxing gym has helped me because, like I said to you, that fear, putting my gloves on, I was in my corner, you know, seconds out, bang, we go for 10 rounds, you know, really scared. And I feel my hands getting wet, you know, because I'm, I'm scared. And then suddenly, that's it. it. It starts, and I get all my stunts, and I start, and the fear goes. And the thing I used to tell myself when I, when I was doing these, uh, these talks is, okay, people come to listen to you. You've got something to say, and, and they want to hear. They want to hear you. They want to listen to you. So just enjoy it get in your stance and start jabbing. And that's the way I started my talks. Yeah. And the fear just, just disappeared. And um, because it was about, if you like, um, using that fear, a bit like Tyson was, was saying, you know, using your fear Full as- Full tomato, yeah, lighting the fire and using the fire to keep you warm rather than letting it- That's it, as your, the fear, you have to use it as your friend and, and you have to use it to be better. Mm. And, um, and it worked for me. I've got, you know, I can identify fully with this, you know, having boxed as, a, as an amateur, um, I still take that pre-fight fear with me now into intimidating circumstances. And like you say, whether it's meetings or whether it's conferences and you have to speak in front of a lot of people that for me doesn't come naturally. I think, well, hang on, I've been in that changing room. I've waited for the call and it was terrifying and I still came out. So this is fine by comparison, which is kind of what you're saying. I mean, it's, it's taking the fear, but when you are in a ring, it's the fear is there in isolation. Mm. It's isolated within these four, four, four ropes. And as soon as you step out, the fear goes. Mm. If you haven't performed though, you've got that maybe that guilty feeling, that sense that you lie to yourself, you lie to others. And actually you are not as truthful and you are not as you as you think you are. Mm. Or, you know, you live in a fantasy cuckoo land about, you know, who you are and who you think you are. But when you get in a ring and you're able to actually step in and do the simple things that you have to do, but do it methodically and while you're thinking about it, it's not something that you are doing in a ring. You know, people say, oh, we're boxing. You know, anybody thinks they can box. 
because all you need is this. Mm. But actually to do it properly, you know, you need to think, you know, it's a mental game, it's chess. And, um, you know, we, we used to play incredible mental games with, with Clinton because I knew he was older. Sometimes I used to tease him and he said, yeah, come on, come on, come on. And it was this thing where I used to punch him and he was putting his head in front of me and thinking, my God, he's got a head that's so hard. Like, well, how, can I, how can I get this guy out? How can I stop him? And not stop him, I put him on the floor and that's it, he's finished. He <laughs> just put enough fear inside him that he's not going to come forward. Yeah, sure. And, you know, we were talking just now about a Josh, Josh, Josh Kelly, uh, a Venetian fight. Clinton's like that. He's coming like a Venetian. He keeps coming, he keeps coming. He's like a train. And um, it's very hard to find to fight somebody and to stop somebody who's like this. How do you do it? You talk about um, Kelly and Avenisia now. Obviously, one of the things that I've seen in terms of you being a boxing fan is obviously I, I said at the start there that you see different celebrities at ringside and so forth. But um, one of the things that I uh, that caught my eye in particular was on your social media in the very first lockdown was you, you did a live and I clicked on it and you were there sparring your other half. I mean, that's, that shows that boxing to a, to a degree, maybe it hasn't taken over your life, but it's become a, a centerpiece of your life. Well, it's important. I mean, look, obviously we're not really sparring, but no. she can eat me as hard as she can. Uh, I've got headgear, I've got my gum shield just in case. I've got my big gloves. She's got 16 ounces. And, and, and the point of me is not for me to, to hit her, it's to move, to work on my defense which is not as slick as it, as, it, as it could be, as it should be, really. I mean, also, I'm getting older. I'm 49. This morning, I was training. I was shadow boxing uh, in my living room. And um, I'm slow. You know, that just jab is slow. That it doesn't come back this fast. And I know the, the reflexes are not there. You know, it's downhill from here. But I, I am intent on, 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 on going as long as I can and, 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 and training and being as good as I can for as long as I can. So that's, that's helping me to, to kind of... Um, practice those skills and 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 to to, to keep in that level as much as I can. But yeah, like I said sure. to you, my my sparring days are, are over. I am officially retired. <laughs> uh, in my in, in my even for Gordon, what if Gordon even for Gordon, well the thing is Gordon is quite big, is 95 kilos, so I'm only 75, 76. Okay. Uh, so we're in a different weight category. Um, as much as maybe I could be faster in the first round or two rounds, you know, if, if he lands one, that's it, it's, it's over, you know. Because <laughs> he's a big fight fan as well. He, he loves boxing, he loves boxing. The only one that doesn't like boxing or any kind of sports is Gino, who doesn't like to do anything. But uh, yeah, we, we, when we're on the road, we talk a lot about boxing. Yeah. But you know, when you have, when we were, when, we, when I was boxing, when I was sparring with, with Clinton and, um, I, I did not mind getting punched in the head. In fact, it, it, was, it was like a badge of honor because you're in the ring, you know, you, you've got to dish some and you're going you to receive some. But I did not mind that. In a way, I kind of liked it. I remember one day, for a sparring session on Saturday, on the Monday, I went to Clarence's house. I was, I was having a, a charity do there. I had a big black eye. And the chap there said, what would you like to drink? I said, well, I have an Earl Grey tea, please. <laughs> <laughs> With my big black eye. You know, and... Um, but now I really don't want to get punched in the head. I, 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 I don't want to do that. So I think that when you come to that point where you don't want to get hit, I want to train. I don't mind body sparring. Uh, I don't mind being pushed, you know, to the limit with the pads or some, some kind of mini sparring with the pad. Uh, but it's not sparring. It's not really when you are going to get it on with somebody else. So you don't get, so you sacrifice having those endorphins for, for not having the head trauma. That's it. That's what it is. That's what it is. Yeah. But it's also a great thing. When you say about a badge of honor, and I was saying this to, to Clinton in our conversation earlier, um, you know, people love the fact that they can train with a guy who has been to the Olympics, been a European champ. You know, I mean, it's a great, it's a great it's practical a, experience. It's amazing. But for me, you know, I, because my relationship with Clinton is one on one. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I come here on Saturday, I train with Clinton, we have our conversation. Um, we train together, and then uh, when we finish, very often I'm the only one left here before he closes up, and we stay here. Uh, we watch the royal wedding here of Harry and Meghan, the two of us, and uh, we even shed the tears, the both of us. I mean, it was just insane in this boxing gym. You know, when people in Italy, they go to the, the piazza, they go and have a coffee with their friends in France, they, they meet in the, in, 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 in the center of town buying their baguette. And here I am, you know, in, in East Dulwich, and this is where I come and where I feel like 
you know, it, it, it's, it's a little man cave where it's it just that I, I can't tell you the, the, the sense of serenity and peace that there is here. And just the conversation that we have, we just talk about our lives, you know, we have our, our own secrets together that we only share uh, with each other. And we talk about boxing, we talk about life, um, we talk about about whatever we talk about, you know, and it's just that sensation that you're just, oh, it's just oh, so relaxed. Is he a fan of yours? Do you, do you talk about the stuff that you do? Does he watch you on telly? Yeah, Clinton watched me on TV. I mean, we don't talk about Fred's career, you know, we talk about stuff because we know each other for so long. We just yeah, talk, sure. do you know what I mean? It's not like, please, can you sign my... No, 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 <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I mean? no, I mean, but, you know, does he watch and then bring that stuff up in conversation? Yeah, we Have do. you gone back and watched any of his fights? Yeah, I've watched them all. Um, in fact, not so long ago, I was watching the Sugar Ray Leonard, Sugar Le Sugar Ray Leonard fight that he had in 1976 in the Olympics. In fact, I was in Canada as well because my daughter is a British champion uh, of um, diving, 10 meter diving. Yeah, and sure. when she was in Montreal there, there was the thing about the Olympics, which reminded me of, of Clinton and yeah. uh, what he did there, you know. In 1976, I was four. Yeah, you mentioned that France wasn't uh, a, an option for boxing in terms of growing up in, in France. What is it just not done there? Is it is it a taboo it's, subject? Or? It's where it's how I was brought up. My parents were both working in hospitals, uh, both nurses, very aware of trauma caused by boxing. You know, obviously, my dad thinks it's not good for you, and and quite rightly. But you know, there's a lot of things in life that's not good for you, and that that you do. And and then it was not a sport, a popular sport. So I used to do football and handball. Uh, I used to run, uh, swim, but, but boxing was never on the card. And I didn't know of a boxing gym. And as much as I wanted to do it, because I remember watching, you know, the first, my first experience of watching uh, boxing was uh, the marvelous Marvin Agla. It was Duran, it was Sugar Ray Leonard. Uh, then it was Tyson. You know, that, that, that's the era that I grew up in. And I always loved it and kind of fantasized about it. And then, um, it was just luck, you know, talking to a friend of mine, I said, I'd love to do boxing. And he introduced me to a chap who was a boxing trainer, did it with him, I loved it. And then this is why I had to find a proper boxing gym and I found Clinton. Did you have a favorite out of Tommy Hearns and Duran and Leonard and Hagler? I mean, they were all uh, incredible. I love, I love Hagler, I love Hagler. I think it was the way that, because I think at the time I must have been eight or nine, 10 or 10 years old or something. And I love that the sense of fear Fear, fearfulness that, that he had. There was no fear with him. He was just completely, completely in control. And you knew that he was going to win because he was just so strong. He was so good. Um, you know, it's extraordinary that he, he, he lost against Sugar Ray Leonard. But Sugar Ray Leonard was clever. You know, the way he stood up after his last fight, you know, with, um, with, with Marvis Agla, and he said, that's it, I'm going to take him on. And everybody thought that it was crazy for him to do so with his eye injury and everything like that. And then he won because he was just, I don't know. I mean, look, it's split decision. Is it, is it not? I don't know. You said about um, Tyson there, obviously you experiencing those pre-fight nerves of your tear-ups with Clinton. You will be able to relate to what Michael Spinks, Frank Bruno and all those guys fought um, when they were lining up to fight Tyson, where it was all, sort of, you know, their fear was magnified even worse than it actually was. I suppose now you sympathize with those guys greatly. Yeah, I mean, you know, when uh, Tyson said, you know, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. I mean, that, that is the truth. But, you know, this you can, you can talk about it in the restaurant business, in business in general. You know, what's going to happen when things don't go your way? How are you going to deal with it? How are you going to react? What are you going to do? How are you going to find a solution? You've got to find a way through. But when you are in a ring, everything is magnified because you are there. And you're fighting literally for your life and you've got nowhere to go. And you can stop. You can actually say no mass a la Duran or you can walk out the ropes. But then you lose your, yourself, you lose your, your sense of pride. You know, that's it. Once you've done that, how you come back from that? Um, you came to the UK via New York. No, I came to the UK 1992, finished my schooling when I was 20, June. July I was here. And uh, never, never went back, oh, okay. never looked back. I mean, I worked in New York after a while, um, a few years later after arriving, I moved to New York and I came back. Um, how, how long did you do in New York? I did about five months in New York. Oh, okay, did yeah. you enjoy it? Yeah, it was lovely, really lovely. And obviously the American thing is, it's actually something you and I have in co common to, to a degree. 
So in between 2000 and 2005, I traveled around America interviewing famous fighters who'd been forgotten from the 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, you obviously did that on a road trip. The only difference was I couldn't afford to eat and you were eating at all the nice places. Um, but was that one of the best experiences of, of your life? I've, I've, I've heard you talk about this with the, the, the Gordon and Gino thing and the, the brotherhood that you guys shared, that you actually concern, you, you weren't keen to do another one because your memories were so special. No, it's not that. I think that it was so special, so perfect. You know, when you think, oh, this is the perfect storm, this is the perfect day. Sure. It was the perfect trip in every way that is possible. And I cannot explain, I cannot describe. You just have to trust me that, oh, that was so beautiful. And when we, because it was so perfect, is how is it possible that we can actually do another trip as good and as perfect as that one? I don't know. But then again, if we can't do it, then maybe we lack creativity, we, have, we lack imagination. Of course we can do it again, but it was so beautiful. I was doing, uh, you know, you, you're doing your interviews after, after scenes and after, after the very last interview, I, I, I teared up, you know, because it was so emotional, it was so strong, it was so beautiful what we've done. And then Gordon looked at me and went, oh, look at him, look at this blonde guy. Then Gino gave me a hug, you know, typical of, of, of Gino. And, um, and is that, that perfect moment. And I said, you know, you know what, guys, at this, right, at this very moment, I could die. I could literally die. That's fine. I'm very happy with that. Were you all friends beforehand? We knew each other. Uh, we were not friends like we are now. And, you know, when you spend so long with people in such a confined environment, you know, in, in, in a road trip like this, where you are always together. You get up, you're together in the morning, you go to the toilet, somebody's behind the door there. You know what I mean? You're, you're literally on top of one another. You get to know each other. And the thing about that is you've got to love people for who they are and what they are. And you've got to accept and take them for what they are. And I think that for me, that's the, I mean, not the, the, the lesson from, from that trip is something that you know, but it kind of reinforces what you already know and, and what you believe in. And uh, because we are so different, you know, Gordon, Gino and me, we are talking cheese, all of yeah, us, yeah. do you see what I mean? But somehow we, we, meet in, each other. we meet in the middle and, and it works. We have fun. Um, people will wonder why you want the pain of sparring and boxing when you live, you, you know, you, you, could, you could live a more privileged life and just do a box size class. Why do you want that feeling? Why do you want that endorphin rush? Is it just, you know, because you, you don't need it. You're putting yourself through it. I need it because you see, this is what you want and what you need. I. I want to be in the middle of the action and I want to learn and I want to box and I want to, you know, when you box and you, and you spar, it's like a trip inside yourself. You really go deep down inside yourself and you discover who you are. And I want to be proficient in boxing. Like, like I said to you, I'm not a boxer. I'm really bad at boxing. And, and all I've done is just come to this gym and spar with Clinton and, and a few other people. That, that's it. And try to stick it on him. And try to stick it on him. And I tried hard. <laughs> and I didn't very succeed very much. But um, yeah, I want to learn and uh, I enjoy it. I really enjoy. But it's not just the, the boxing in itself. It's the process of boxing. I think about it before. I think about it after. I go to sleep and... Before I go to sleep, I, 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 I rehearse kind of what I've done. I see, you know, I go back. Okay, this is what I've done here. Okay, oh, that was good the way I went to the body there and I came back up. How about if I was maybe doing a left hook? I think about all these things, but because also we are in a different category. He's an athlete. I'm just a regular guy, right? So I want to be at his level. And the only way for me to be better and to be good at what I do is to be with people who are better than me. And if I am next to and next to greatness and I am, I am really working hard at, at being like them, although I will never attain their level, I'm going to come closer than if I spar with somebody who's mediocre or somebody who's really crap or, sure. or do it by myself. I cannot learn. And the amount of time and thought that you say that you put into it, your sessions and stuff, that is probably part of the reason why you've been quite vocal about gyms being closed in the pandemic. Because of what people get in terms of their mental health and what well, they, not just an hour from the gym, but what it gives them the rest of the day. I think it's important, yeah, that people uh, that people train, that people, you know, I mean, the, the Romans used to say uh, a healthy mind in a healthy body. 
And, 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 and I believe in that. And I believe in, in, in training. I mean, if I couldn't train, I mean, we were talking before about boxing books and, uh, you know, I, I love the, the Tyson Undisputed Truth book. And uh, in fact, I was very inspired when he talked about training in prison in two slash three square meters, you know, body weight training, whether you do your squats, your push-ups, whether you do uh, dips, whether you shadow box and all sort of things like that. You can do it here. You, all you need is two squares. Like it's enough for me to, to train. And so the discipline. it's the discipline. And, um, and it's hard because when you're pushing yourself, as you're by yourself and, and you're in a small room, can you imagine the, the, the motivation that you need? But the motivation doesn't come, it's not inside your head. I mean, it's two things, the motivation. I think it's inside your head, and that gets you on the, on the floor doing your exercises. Uh, but it's also about the doing of the exercises that motivates you. Sure. Because one feeds the other. And because you feed yourself these things, then it's about positive affirmation. And in fact, Mohammed Ali was talking about that. And when these positive affirmation, you know, you repeat them often enough, they become the truth. And because, because they are the truth, they are you. So I spend a lot of time talking to myself. I spend a lot of time in the gym conditioning my body, and I still condition my body. But I think the most important is not really so much the conditioning of the body, it's the conditioning of the mind into thinking, into being uh, the way that I want my mind to think and into thinking in the way that I want, I want to be. I want to be a certain type of a person. And so... As much as I can train, for example, eating the bag or pads or doing whatever exercises in the gym, I've got to exercise my mind to be the person that I want to be. Because if I'm not that, it's only my fault. I cannot blame anybody else. But it takes time. Talking about um, training and confinement, which is ironic, obviously, given that we're in a pandemic. But um, there was a light heavyweight in the late 70s called James Scott, and he was in prison, in Norway prison, uh, waiting, awaiting sentencing. And he was fighting in prison. So the, the broadcasters, HBO and stuff, would go into the prison and broadcast his fights. And he would have to train in prison. So he was called Superman because he was doing a thousand push-ups a day. Whoa. And for his hour of activity, he was going out and running around the yard for an hour because um, that was all he was allowed. Um, and he, he had these intense fitness levels, became number one contender in prison. I actually went and interviewed him in 2004 in prison, in Northern State Prison, where he, where he was still staying. And um, yeah, like you said, it's about confinement. I suppose the other side of it is the aesthetics of, of things and, and what people get out of once you start putting it in. And Clinton's talked about some of your success stories you have with people, weight loss and, and that kind of stuff. So that's a byproduct as well in terms of self-esteem and, and stuff that you get from it. Um, I don't care about the beauty of the gym. You know, I don't care about wearing fancy clothes and having all my fancy gear. You know, just like the Instagram guys all look at me, you know. <laughs> you should see me in here. I come with my shorts and my old trainers and generally topless here and I just eat the bag. You know, and, and I like the smell of sweat. I like that old school boxing gym. I really, when I come in the gym here, I'm in a different, different mode. Why is that? Why is that? Because you don't need that because you surely, you know, when you when you reach your your level, you don't need this this. What level? What level am I? You're 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 an, you're an A-list guy. Well, this is what you think, maybe, or this is sure. how you perceive me. Sure. sure. I I am Fred. I'm sure. a waiter from Limoges. Do you understand? I well, live I a very understand. I live a very simple life. I like to come here and train, and and I like to push myself and and go as fast and as hard as I can possibly do, and and. Um, and, and I've done that all my life with everything I've done. And, you know, I've been very lucky, very privileged to work with only the very best in the business, be it in the restaurant business or uh, with other people in my own business where I teach uh, uh, corporation and other businesses about customer service. You know, for example, I designed uh, the art of service for Bentley Motors, for example, or Jaguar Land Rover, which are just amazing to work with brands like this because the level that they do is really up there. You're not talking about a tiny little car made in a garage. <laughs> you know, you're talking about the, the top of the range, you know, of, of cars. And um, I think that this, what has driven me, and now I tell you one thing, Trace, I avoid time wasters like the plague. I only spend time with people I want to spend time with and people that, I think I've got something to share with me, not just to give me, something to share. We're going to have an exchange, but I only want to be with people who are good. You know, Socrates held the pursuit of life 
the, 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 pursuit of, um, the pursuit of virtue as the meaning of life. And virtue is about knowing what is good and bad, right and wrong. Now, we can debate this sure. for many hours. <laughs> uh, but it, it's fundamentally that. I want to spend time with people who are good. Now, when you think about good and goodness, I mean, you can think about what is good. You can think about boxing. What is a good boxer? What is good boxing training? What is good boxing exercise? What is good sparring? Were you good today? Um, but there are so many different elements that go into that goodness, so many different layers. But ultimately, it's good. And when you are in the ring, when you are there in the, between these four ropes, when you're talking about good, it's also about, you're talking about words like truth. You know, when you're in a boxing, people talk about truth, they talk about courage. But you're not talking about any other layers here. I'm talking about truth. What is truth? Now, people will tell you truth, and they are right, of course. Truth is about where you are standing. So my truth is here, I'm standing here, your truth is there, and somebody else's truth is over there. That's true. But there is also, I believe, that universal truth where we can all agree this is the truth because this is what it is. So I am looking for my truth. And, you know, as, as a human being, as a man, I want to be a man that's just going to evolve and, and, and change and become like a vintage wine. You know, you start with, you're a nice, fresh, bubbly, you know, full of, full of fruit. <laughs> And then you can go there and turn into vinegar, or you can turn into a vintage wine, you know, that you want to drink, you know, like a 1945 Mouton Rothschild, for example. And you're like, oh my God, he's got the fruit, he's got the maturity, <laughs> he's got the spice. I want to be that. But it's my responsibility. Yeah. It's my responsibility to be that and to work at it. And Clinton has been part of that journey, sure. an integral part of the journey. Um, a lot of young fighters, it's become, it's become quite common to talk about mental health issues in boxing. Um, and that feeds into uh, different parts of it. The solitary lifestyle that fighters have, the struggle that fighters have and the pressure they have with fights. Also the social media side of things. Um, I've spoken to a couple of fighters recently. Tony Jeffries, who's made a very successful living for himself as a former Olympic bronze medalist who's now got a big social media following and a YouTube client base, and another top form amateur who's come off social media because he can't stand the negativity. It's a tough, it's a tough space to be in, social media. I mean, what's your take on that and in terms of mental health? Because you, you do have a lot of the answers. You do have a massive audience. I'm guessing you've experienced some negativity. Yeah, I mean, we all have experienced negativity, but you experience negativity in your real life. And I cannot cancel people. Yeah, I can stop to go and see them. Do you see what I mean? Or I, I, don't, I don't talk to them. I think that you, I mean, social media is not really real life. I'm never going to post a picture when I'm sad or when I'm crying. Oh, look, I'm crying too. Do you know what I mean? But anyway, I'm quite a positive, happy guy. You know, I have happy thoughts. I get up in the morning and I feel grateful and happy to be alive. And I, I, I'm, I can't believe the sun is shining again today is another day. I'm alive. Life is beautiful. I say that to myself every single day. And days go very fast. And right now, in this lockdown, I live day by day. I don't think about what I'm going to do in April or May or June. I haven't booked a holiday. Um, I'm just waiting to see what is going to happen. And through that, you know, my aim is to be, is to be good and to be positive. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's, you know, you get to maybe, I don't know, six o'clock, seven o'clock, and you think, oh my God, what's going to happen? I could go to the pump and have a pint or do this or do that. But we have to deal with it. You know, we have to deal with a shift in reality. But if I cannot deal with it, I question my creativity and my ability to deal with life. Just like you would if you're in a boxing ring, you know, you're in a boxing ring, you've got to deal with it. And just now you're talking about fighters, you know, uh, the very only uh, real fight that they had, I organized a boxing tournament, a white collar boxing. And uh, I did that for my charity, working with uh, disadvantaged kids. And this was to help them get into training, education, full-time employment within the hospital industry. So I organized a white collar tournament. So I called my mates. I said, yeah, no problem. Uh, we call this guy called Alan Lacey, which you may know yeah, from the Real sure. Fight yeah, Club, who helped us. Yeah. Clinton was providing the training for the fighters. And uh, I went to see Marcus Waring in his kitchen. And I said, because Marcus was a, an ex-boxer, he boxed as an amateur. I said, do you want to fight? 
And uh, then subsequently, so he said yes, subsequently he was giving interviews saying that I disrespected him because I went into his kitchen <laughs> and all that, you know what I mean? And then we had all these conversations about who was going to wear red, who was going to wear blue, who was going to get in the ring first. Who's the A side, who's the B side, I love it. <laughs> and uh, because it was the tournament I was organizing, so I wanted to fight in the middle of the bill. I had no intention to be at the end, to be top of the bill, because I didn't care about that. I wanted to enjoy the boxing. And I had top chefs like Michel Roux Jr. cooking the food. We sold 200 tickets in the space of a week. I mean, it was a, a real success. 50 grand that we, that we raised for the charity it was fantastic. And we had um, nine or 10 bouts. Monica Galetti was on one of the bouts. It was amazing. Uh, I had the gladiators, you know, sky gladiators, walking sure. me to the, uh, to the ring. Unfortunately, Clinton couldn't be my corner. I had somebody else doing my corner. Um, anyway. I, I just couldn't believe all this to and through, you know, before the fight, you know, about these mind games being played and all that, because I just wanted to enjoy myself and have a pint. Otherwise, I couldn't have a pint until the very <laughs> end. Anyway, we come on, and um, I was so fit. I was a bit like Josh Kelly, if you like, uh, before the fight. I was fit. I was big for my weight. I was fast. I was hungry. And um, I did not take any prisoners. I really was on a mission. I wanted to knock him out. But... There, in the middle of this thing there, I suddenly froze in the sense that I did not play my game. I had practiced a game in the gym. Jab, I was, was good with hooks, the one-twos, and uh, I just threw everything at him. I threw the sink, I threw, I mean, the whole bathroom went in. I mean, it was just like, a, it, it turned into almost like a wrestling match because I wanted to knock him out. I was coming close. I'm, you know, I, I wasn't, you know, when you do in fighting, you have to know what you're doing. I'm not a specialist in fighting. I'm really not, unfortunately. I'm still working on it. Still, still dreaming in my head to become the <laughs> world champion. Do you know what I mean? And, um, and at the end, I lost on point. It did not hurt me. I, I've been hurt much more in training. There was no nothing there. But he played his game well, jabbing from a distance. And he just read me. But it was the experience. But the thing that was interesting for me is after that, anyway, we, we raised the money, which was great. Oh, by the way, you know, because we had that thing about who's going to wear blue, who's going to wear red. And statistics are, if you wear blue, you're going to lose. And that Marcus just got to wear the red. And I thought to myself, you know what? <laughs> I came out with no top on. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> because there's no way I'm just going to wear blue. I didn't want to wear blue. Anyway, it did not help me. At the end of the day, I lost. But what was interesting is the night after I'd lost, we went to a club, my dad was here, uh, came, to, came to watch the fight. It was, it was an amazing night and we went to this club and after I went back home and I had to come back on earth after that night in the club where we had a bit of drink and stuff, I had lost. And I had to come to terms with that loss and no word of a lie, it took me a month to recover from that loss, mentally to think, how did I lose? You know, I was, I was replaying that fight inside my head at night during the day. Uh, I was watching it over and over and over, and I was getting upset really with myself, thinking, what have you done, Fred? What have you done? Look at that, look at that, look at that. Look what you, what were you doing here? I was really upset with myself. But it was interesting to learn about myself through that loss and to be able to take it, because it was a real loss. I was. I, it took me a month, really took me 30 days to recover every night thinking about it, you know, going to bed thinking, I was depressed, depressed hard, because, because of it. When people know you've got a fight coming up, there's also a lot of expectations, isn't there? People asking you, when's the fight, how's it going, all the rest of it. And all of a sudden, there's a bit of an identity shift, shift where, where you become a fighter and everyone talks to you about that thing. And so when you've lost, you know that all the questions are going to come. How was the fight? And people take, you know, have digs at you. Yeah. Oh, Freddie, yeah. what have you done there? Oh, and, and they oh. have the digs, not knowing what it took to get in there. But it doesn't matter what it took. What matters is the result. You know, I don't care about that, you know, and I'm not going to go, yeah, I trained this. I mean, I used to train three hours a day. I used to, because I live in Peckham, I used to run to work. I used to train an hour in the afternoon in the gym and run back at night. And I did that for years. I mean, I was like, a, I was like an urban gazelle. It was just like... <laughs> I was, I was incredibly fit and I should have won that fight. But that's what you say to yourself, you know, because the guy that I was fighting was much more experienced. And uh, in fact, at one point, second round, um, the bell went and I did not hear the bell. It's a funny thing because the only thing that my senses were scrambled. The only mm -hmm. thing I could do is see. I couldn't hear and I didn't hear the bell. So I carried on pummeling him. 
uh, or trying to pummel him. And then his brother, who was his cornerman, went into the ring, stopped us. It was a big scramble. My cornerman got into the ring. It was just a big scramble. You know, it was like, <laughs> <laughs> you think, where are we now? Are we in Las Vegas or something like that? <laughs> we were on Palmal, you know what I mean, doing a charity do. And here I am trying to kill this guy. And he's trying to kill me back. And his brother wants to fight me. And he was just mad. Brilliant. You have this positive predisposition where you say you're grateful for every day and you wake up and, and, and thank thank whoever it is you thank for. I don't for believe in God. I don't believe in God. I don't have any, any religious in, in, in inclination. I just believe in being good. Um, and that is what drives me, you know? Um, that, that for me, that's very important. I, I, sadly, you know, and maybe for me, you know, I, I don't believe that. I believe that when we're dead, that's it. And, and, and I think that, you know, I have to enjoy myself now. I have to enjoy my children now. I have to enjoy my friends and my family because once I'm gone, I'm gone. I'm never gonna see them again. But so when you believe in God, maybe you think, you know, I'll see you in the afterlife. I don't believe that. But when we talk about saying, oh, today's gonna to be a good day and so forth, in life, not every day can be a, a 10 out of 10. It can't even be an eight out of 10. Have there been periods in your life where you've really struggled? Of course, of course, plenty, plenty. Still now, you know, there's some days where you think, oh God, it's hard, it's hard. But um, is there really, what, um, not triggered by anything, just a, just, a, just a slump? No, there's things that are triggered by things, you know, and I'm not gonna go into details here, um, but there are some things in life that affects you, that, that things that happen, or little things maybe, you know, something doesn't go too well, you're expecting something to happen, it doesn't happen, you get disappointed, you know, and it's just how low do you get depends, depends on you. Because if you think about, See, if you think of yourself in 20 years time, in 10 years time, and you look back and you think, do you actually care about that? About what happened then? You don't. But on the moment, at the time, you think, you think it's, it's just, just the end of the world, really, basically, you know? And, and, and when things, you know, like big things happen in your life, you know, is how do you deal with it? How do you deal with it? You know, whether, you know, you, you fall out with people, whether people die around you, and it's how are you going to, to react and how are you going to be able to deal with these unsurmountable, how do you say in English, unsurmountable uh, yeah, obstacles, insurmountable, yeah, insurmountable yeah. obstacles, which they may or may not be insurmountable, but this is how you perceive them to be. And, and, and that is up to you. And uh, you only know when you're facing those obstacles, how you're going to deal and how you're going to react with them. And um, I think that one thing with me, I, I mean, look, I have an, uh, I mean, maybe I've had some, some big ones, or, but I don't think I had some big ones. You, know, you have to put things in perspective in the grand scheme of things. Some people have had real, real, real Trauma. obstacles and traumas. I mean, horrible things that happened to them in their lives. I cannot compare myself to them. You know, I have to you think- You get through your life saying, oh, um, you know, there's always someone worse off. You can get through your life saying that, but it's also that thing where everyone's fighting a battle you you know nothing about. Yeah. So what might be you might think it's small by comparison. It might be crippling you. Yeah, but then again, it's how we are and how we react to it. You know, it's our circumstances and how we react to it. You know, mm. just like now, for example, the lockdown, we're all reacting to it in a different way, depending on our circumstances and our state of mind. But how it's how we actually take that waiting, because we have to wait. Mm. We are just all waiting. And like I said to you just before, you know, I'm living day by day. I'm really just taking it day by day. Um, today coming to meet you here and to see Clinton was, I was looking forward to it. And I'm enjoying myself, I'm in the moment. Yesterday, you know what I did yesterday? I got up late and all I did was cook a curry goat. And I have been practicing that curry goat since March, last March. And I have mastered the recipe now. It's as Jamaican, as authentic as it gets. And yesterday I did something that I was a bit worried when I was cooking it. I put four times the amount of coconut in the curry goat that I did last time. And that was just incredible. Now, maybe you have to put one more scotch bonnet because it wasn't maybe as hot as it could have been. But the reason why I'm telling you that is because I had the best day yesterday. All I did, I chopped my onions. And I did not chop my onions to chop my onions so that I could go and chop my spring onions to go and chop my garlic to go and chop my ginger. No, I chopped my onions to chop my onions. When I chopped my onions, all I did was chop the onions. 
I was listening to music and I chopped my onions. Then I chopped my spring onions. Then I chopped my garlic and I chopped my, 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 my ginger, prepared my scotch bonnet, I washed my thyme, I fried my, my, my goats, salt, pepper, my curry. Uh, and I went through that process very slowly. I took my time. I was in that moment enjoying cooking my curry goat. And the moment that I was in was the moment that I was alive. And I felt, I can't tell you how much serenity and how much peace I felt yesterday. And then I thought, what am I going to cook? I can't cook rice and peas. So I've got authentic Jamaican there. I said, okay, I've got cauliflower. I make cauliflower cheese, the old fashioned way, like my mom made it. Then I made some pomme d'arfin, which is basically potato rosti. You know, you grate your potatoes, <laughs> salt and pepper, you remove the water, and then you put it in a pan and you fry them with butter. There was lots of butter in my stuff yesterday. So, and then you turn it around. And then after you just finish it in the oven. And then I fried some plantain in salted butter, French salted butter. And that was dinner. I mean, man. That took me from 10 o'clock in the morning until 5 o'clock until I had my dinner because I'd, I felt to myself, I had a big dinner on Saturday night. I'm just going to uh, not eat too much today and just take my time. And it was the best day ever. And that day kept on going and going. And at the end of the day, I was thinking, it's a shame it's not 11 o'clock. But then if I think that, I'm being nostalgic. I want to go back to the time that I was, but time has moved on. It's now 10 o'clock at night. So although, because at 10 o'clock, I wasn't in the moment like I was at 11 o'clock or two o'clock or three o'clock. You see what I mean? Sure. So I, that was the call to myself to say, Fred, switch back on, get back in your moment, enjoy it. I know you're in bed doing nothing now, but just enjoy that moment. And that's why I did. So when you are chopping your onions and you've got the music on, it's not high. And I was dancing. It's not highway to hell, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it was Gregory Isaac. <laughs> I was listening to Afro beats. Um, and I, I was just, listening to beautiful bits. And I played football the day before with my son and I was stiff because in the morning I did 40 minutes of training at home. Then I went to play football for an hour and 15 minutes and I was stiff, really, really stiff. And so I, did, I started to dance, but I, as I was dancing and I was going like that, I was thinking, oh, I was feeling the pain. <laughs> but the dancing also, it was good because I was dancing, but also it was stretching my body <laughs> and I was stretching that in. It was good. Um, that's brilliant. In terms of... Um, the boxing side of things. I mean, I was speaking to Clinton earlier. Do you think there's any way you get him on first dates in his coat? I could get him on first dates anytime. Actually, he's he'd be great though, wouldn't he? He'd be great. He's come to the first date restaurant once to have a meal. Uh, I invited him. You know, we have background data. So he came in and uh, the room stopped because he came in with, you know what he's dressed like, you know what he's like with the way he's dressed. And I was like, who is coming in here? Is he royalty? Who is he? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. He likes to make an entrance. Oh, doesn't he just, doesn't he just? <laughs> saw him getting out of the car today. Saw him a, a mile away. <laughs> no, it's brilliant. In terms of, um, by the way, one thing I was going to say, obviously, you, you, you talk there about living in the moment. Is that, how, is that a coping mechanism? Is that how you deal with things? Live, you know, live hour by hour and take things hour by hour? Because like I said, a lot of fighters out there are struggling with mental health and different things, and they don't have the answers. You appear to obviously be quite well-rounded and, and have some of the answers. I don't think I have answers, actually. actually. I think I've got more questions than answers. Um, but I, I talk to myself, and I look at what I do. I monitor what I do, and I think about where am I now, you know, oh, I, I can think, oh, I'm not happy right now. Uh, this is not going the way I want it to go. Now you need to, you need to switch. And sometimes you can't switch, like that. you can't talk like that. You can't rationalize with mm -hmm. yourself. You just, just, it just goes on and then, you know, you waste time. You waste time, you waste hours, you can waste days in, in that state of mind. So it's up to us to take that control. And um, at the moment, I feel that, there is, look, I, I like to be busy. Busy is good, busier is better. Right, my resolution every year is more. I want more. I want more fun. I want more love. I want more enjoyment. I want more work. I want to do, to box more. I want to do more. I want to do more of everything, you know. And I want it now. That's, that's I've got a very big appetite for life. I, I lust for life. It's massive. But right now, it is what it is, and I've got to enjoy what there is to have. There's no point for me to cry, to go on the floor, to just, there's no point. There's nothing, it's gonna do nothing for me. It's gonna do nothing for humanity, for, for anybody around me. But also I think, you know, I'm a father, you know, I have a, I have a family. 
the kids need to look up to me. You know, if I can be the positive guiding light that they can look up to, and you know, if I'm the one who's going to crumble, who's going to be all negative or you know, then I don't think it's the example that they want to see, you know, and I, if there's one who needs to stand, it's me. Mm. I have a responsibility. But I have a responsibility, I think, first to myself, and, and it's important that, 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 that I remember that at times when tough, things are, are, are tough, but it's also important that I do it for, for my children. They need to know that their dad is a rock, but a rock can cry. Yeah, sure. Do you have a bucket list? Uh, no, I just, um, I just go where life takes me. You know, if you were asking me, you know, people say, oh, what's your five years, 10 years plan? But I don't have any plan. Uh, you know, I've worked in the restaurant business all my life. And in fact, it's my charity work that led me to do television. Because at the time in 2011, when I did my, my first TV series with Michel Roux, I was running, I mean, I'm still running the charity that I started, like I was saying to you before about disadvantaged kids and, and, and getting them into, um, into work and, and training and employment and stuff like that. And that was picked up by the BBC, then a show was made. And then one thing led to another. And because I enjoy the work of media, I mean, in the restaurant business, you have to, you have to love PR and marketing in order to do your job well, because your restaurant has to be busy. If your restaurant is busy, you're going to have a great experience. You're going you're gonna to really create something magical that that's going to deliver an amazing experience for your customers. If the restaurant's not busy, it's not going to work. So you need to, to really embrace and love PR and marketing. So I was always involved in that world, but not in the world that I am now, in this kind of media world, if you see what I mean. But I pursued it because I, I enjoy the creative aspects of it. And it's just like the restaurant business. It's about you perform as an individual, but you've got to work as a team. And there are so many different layers, so many different... Um, uh, uh, if you like, things that you need to do and, and that you need to understand. And it's just like the boxing. Before I started TV, I didn't know anything. I went into the ring, I didn't know nothing. And I started to spar. And I went into TV, same thing. I have no idea. And then the more you are in that world and the more you learn, and then I want to know, how oh, does this camera work? And what about this sound? And what about the light? And why don't you do this? And why don't you do And then I fancy myself a bit of a director, of a producer. I'm not. But just like I fancy myself a boxer, <laughs> do you see what I mean? <laughs> so I always have these ideas and I want to have fun. I really want to have fun. And, and the only way to have fun is to work with people. And look, when I was 16, or, you know, I'm, I'm a, a schoolboy from Limoges in the center of France. I'm just like everybody else. I'm nobody. Do you see what I mean? Um, but you just go and evolve in the world. You meet somebody who's good at something and you talk to them and they talk to you and then... You develop a friendship, but at the end of the day, it's about trust. Are you going to deliver? You know, I'm there, I'm on a TV show, I've got a, I've got a job to do as a presenter. Am I going to deliver? Okay, I deliver that as a presenter, yes. How much value I'm going to add? How do I add the value? What do I do? You know, do I provide ideas? Do I provide solutions uh, which can be seen on screen or behind the screens, but have an impact on the screen? And what kind of reputation do you have? Do people like you? Because if they like you, they're going to want to work back with you. And then afterwards, they tell Tom the Canary, and then you keep working. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that needs to be said about, you know what, my kids, for example, they are the kindest, sweetest, most compassionate human beings. I mean, every father would say that. Sure. But I'm not just saying that. They are. Yeah. And what more do you want? What more can you expect from your children but to be kind human beings that you can be proud of? Just because they're good, good people, you know, they've got a good heart. Mm. That's all you want, you know? Um, you said that your parents were reluctant to let you put some gloves on. What if that conversation comes around at your house? I mean, I, my son, who's, who's 11 now, when he was nine, he said, uh, I said, what, what shall we do for your uh, birthday? He said, uh, I want to do a boxing tournament. I said, I, <laughs> to me, I want to see if my friends can fight. <laughs> so I called Clinton. I said, Clint, uh, my son wants to have a, 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 a boxing tournament uh, for his birthday. What do you think? He said, yeah, no problem. Anyway, we organized it. There was about 15 kids in there. The parents were there. Of course, obviously, all the parents were there. And uh, he got into the ring. So Clinton gave them a bit of a master class. Then they went into the ring, and they were all sparring. And there was this girl called Tara. Yeah. He had to stop the fights because this girl was just going to knock somebody out. <laughs> 
<laughs> you should have seen how she was. She was so fierce. And that's what he wanted to do. But you know, it's, I think it's the beauty of having a daughter and a son. My daughter, obviously, she's a girl. She does girly things. And my son, you know, we do this man's thing. But the year after, when he was 10 last year, we did, uh, we did um, how do you call it, um, the gun? Oh, paintball. Paintballing. Yeah, sure. And uh, it's just fun to do different stuff like that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Did he get you? He got me. Yeah, we, we, we organized uh, with 30 kids. Oh, wow. And okay. I said to all the parents, you br I'm not taking your kids. You bring the kids and you are responsible for them when you are there. And it was one dad said, no, can I? No, no, no. You stay there. I'm not responsible for your child, okay? We went in. Within five minutes, I kid you not, 25 kids come out <laughs> screaming and crying. <laughs> they were bruised everywhere. And he couldn't carry on. So we carried on. There was only five kids who were playing until the end, until the whole afternoon. All the parents, all the kids went and left back oh, for that's brilliant. Um, You said obviously no five-year plan, no 10-year plan, which is fine. But um, I think a lot of people will get to a point in life, and I'm, I'm similar age to you, where you do have some kind of end game or, or imagination as to where things might go. Do you it have depends it? if I'm still alive. Yeah, of course. I'm 49. Let's say best I case. Could, uh, could finish tomorrow. could finish today. I hope not. I've enjoyed, oh, I've enjoyed oh. our conversation. Me I, too. I hope you've got a bit more left in <laughs> Me here. too, but you don't know. You don't know what's going to happen. Look, you know, I think it's important to think, you know, would you retire? You know, are you putting enough on the side? I think a lot of young people, you know, don't don't think about their retirement uh, because it's so far away. Mm. And if it's not retirement, he's having a bit on the side, having a bit of a cushion. But it's not always possible because rents are very expensive, mortgages are very expensive. I bought my first flat, 75 grand. It was 20 years ago or something like that. We sold it for twice the amount. Um, and the mortgage at the time was 400 pound a month. But I was earning, I think, 27 grand, right? Mm. Now, if you're still earning 27 grand or 30 grand, how much is going to be your first property that you're going to buy? 300, 400? Do you yeah. know what I mean? You don't find flats yeah. for 75 or something like that, unless you go, you know, in the stick somewhere sure. and you got to and you got to commute for 400 kilometers, you know, to to go to work. So it's really difficult. So there's a shift here. We're in a different situation. The kids are now 20. A different situation than than when I was 20. Very very different. Yeah. But um, when I mean I don't make plans. I am planning, I am thinking, okay, I'm working on this, I'm working on that, I'm working on this, I'm working on that. But uh, nobody in business anyway, I mean, some people might, you know, big corporation who, who make big factories, you know, like the type of Amazon or uh, Bentley, whatever, they, being, they, they, they built a factory somewhere and they know that this factory is, is an investment for the next 10 years. Sure. But if you're doing restaurant, if you're doing uh, what I do with customer service, with, with training and, 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 and developing solutions for, for businesses or TV programs, you know, I mean, podcasts, are you planning your podcast for the next two, three years? You're not, you know what I mean? You're thinking, okay, I'm going to do this this week, the week after, maybe you've got somebody who can't do something and you're going to do it in six months, but that's it. Sure. And if I think, yesterday I was speaking with my partner about the end of lockdown, and what's going to happen in May and June and all that. And I said to her, I don't think about it. I really live day by day. I have an eye on the future and I'm thinking about what I might be doing in April and May. I'm thinking, okay, yeah, September, I could do this or that. But I don't know what's going to happen right now. Um, James Hester, who's one of my subscribers, said, Fred's last evening on Earth. A bit fatalistic, I know, given what we've just talked about. But do you go to Madison Square Garden for an undisputed heavyweight world title fight? Or do you go to, is it Mirazor? Mia Resort, what's yeah, that? Or My Resort, the world's best restaurant, 2020. Probably I go to a restaurant. Would you? Yeah, I go to a restaurant and have a nice meal. I would have some oysters, I would have a nice steaks, I would have my dad's french fries, which are the best in the world, a nice green salad from the garden, and uh, possibly uh, 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 some cheese and an apple tart. And a nice bottle of Bordeaux, and that's it. And you watch the fight on the telly. And I watch the fight on the telly, or you know, I go like that on my phone, which I <laughs> do very Clinton. often. You know, when I'm traveling, I'm on my phone at that, and I'm just watching the fights. Or you go around to Clinton's and watch it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, while I've got you, obviously, you just uh, it's a, a casual boxing fans question, but everyone wants to know about Fury and Joshua. What 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 goes down? And look. I suppose you've spoken about it with Clinton. I spoke about it with Clinton, uh, and and for me, it's a 50-50 fight. I think that both of good attributes and good chances to win. Clinton thinks that Joshua is going to nick it because he thinks he's big, he's athletic, and 
that is so strong and he's going to at some point catch Fury. And that Fury hasn't fought somebody as big as Joshua before. All the other opponents of, of Fury have been smaller than him. And he's a big bloke. He's tall. He's very rangy. And he's awkward. He's, he moves like a, like a lightweight. But, but, but Joshua is, is a mountain of a, mind, of a man. And that, that's Clinton's argument. Clinton gets it right more, more often than I. I don't know. If you ask me my opinion, I think it's 50-50 and I'm just going to enjoy the fight. I mean, just like the, I mean, we were so lucky uh, yesterday, Saturday, to watch Kelly versus a, a, a Venetian, you know, because such an entertaining fight. I mean, I did not think about anything while I was watching that fight. Yeah. I was at Good home, job. I was having a beer and I just switched off. And thank you to both fighters for that great night of entertainment, really. Yeah. No. Fred, I'm so grateful that you've taken some time out to come and see us. I've really enjoyed it and, and thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you to you, Trace. Thank Thanks. you.